Welcome to the Afterlife Files, where we investigate what we know about near-death experiences, shared death experiences, and how they affect you. Unlike podcasts that just tell stories, we will help you make sense of those accounts so you can incorporate the insights into your life. I think you'll find that once having your most profound questions answered, you'll find more peace and joy living here in the physical world. We are extremely fortunate in having William Peters with us today. He's going to share his groundbreaking research into shared death experiences. You are going to be among the very first to hear the results of his work. As you watch this interview, listen for these four things. Number one, the basics of what is shared death experience and its signature elements. And number two, how are near death and shared death experiences similar? or different. Three, toward the end of the interview, William's got a very interesting section on negotiating with the light. And number four, don't miss him explain how you can improve the possibilities of having a shared death experience if you want to. I have to warn you, this interview is filled with insights you don't want to miss. So you may want to grab a pen and jot down those nuggets of wisdom that are important to you. I'll start off your note taking. You ready? Our most heartfelt human relationships are the substrate of a shared death experience. I'll repeat that. Our most heartfelt human relationships are the substrate of a shared death experience. William will explain that more fully. So here's our interview. Hi everyone. We are so privileged today to have William Peters with us. Let me read you his bio. William Peters is the founder of the Shared Crossings Project and director of its research initiative. He is a practicing psychotherapist who has recently published his first book with Simon & Schuster called At Heaven's Door. Commercial. Here we go. This is it. Uh, subtitle what shared journeys to the afterlife teach us about dying well and living better. He's also a good friend and a colleague. Welcome, William. Really glad you're here. Oh, thanks, Scott. Really good to be here with you. So everybody, I have I finished reading this last night. And I have to tell you, William, I just so enjoyed this book. I haven't enjoyed a book like this for so long, it made me laugh. It made me cry. It, um, I think one of the important things that it did was it helped create a vocabulary around shared death experiences. And anybody who's had one or, or something like it, and they read this book, they'll go, oh, I now have some words for what it is that happened to me. And I'm thinking about you know, this afternoon after we're done, going back and rewriting sections of my of my story, just so that I can incorporate some of the beautiful language that's in it. Lastly, though, what I think a, a real contribution is, um, you know, in the world of near death experiences, Ken Ring has written about the benign virus, which is, you know, when you when you take a, a book, and you write about near death experiences or shared death experiences, the energy of that experience is there on the written page. And those of us that are sensitive are able to pick that up and be able to go and experience that, um, whatever's going on with that individual on the page. And I thank you so much for not editing these stories to death. Because as you know, sometimes when you read them, it's like, you know, you read and you go, what? There's no energy to these. And then other stories that are taken and treated uh, better, like you did, um, the energy of the experience is still there. And boy, that makes a difference for, for those of us um, 
who've had a shared death experience because you can, you can feel it. You can feel what's going on. And so, um, I didn't mean to give you a big commercial like that, but yeah, it's really important. And, um, I wanted to thank you for writing this really wonderful, um, wonderful work. So, I would let, let's start with the basics. What is a shared death experience? Yeah. Well, thank you, Scott. I like, I really appreciate you sharing your response to At Heaven's Door. And, you know, I didn't ever see myself as uh, an author writing this type of a book, honestly, but I realized that I'd had these experiences and it wasn't out there. Uh, the, there wasn't the label. There wasn't an understanding. They were being discounted, dismissed, and in some cases disparaged when people shared them to mental health providers, end of life care providers, well-intentioned, lovely people, but they just didn't have any uh, vocabulary to identify it. And so um, I, I, I wrote this just for the reasons that you identified, which is, wow, there's a language for this. Now there's typologies. And I put together a research team and I'm really pleased with what we've been able to do. Uh, but I'll tell you the definition is a shared death experience occurs when somebody dies and a caregiver, loved one, even a bystander will report or express that they shared in the journey with the dying from this human life to a benevolent afterlife. And why use benevolent? Because we don't have any examples where where, they're, where these dying people are going are not, quite frankly, sublime. <laughs> uh, we, don't, we just don't have them. We have situations where people say they're a little confused when they get there, or there's mm -hmm. a little bit of trauma in the transition, but ultimately uh, they land in a good place and are really grateful to be in that afterlife. So the experiencers, as we call them, uh, they say that they either sense something about uh, a dying process that they're sensing and participating in. Uh, and that, by the way, I should say, can be either at bedside or at a distance remotely. Uh, we were shocked in the research. I shouldn't say, I wasn't particularly, I, I knew remotes were happening. I just didn't know that they were two thirds of our cases. That was the research that got, oh, wow. Okay, it's really that high. So one third are at bedside and two thirds are remote. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But you can either sense a shared, uh, you're, you can have an experience of sensing. That means you sense something happened to a loved one or someone kind of visits you rather quickly. And that's all you do is sense them come across you, their energy. You just say, oh my gosh, something just, I just felt something with Jane and, and I felt a little nauseous in my stomach, but then, but then I felt something good. You know, I felt like relief or happiness. Well, that's weird. And then all of a sudden, you know, you get a call and 15 minutes later, uh, I've got some really bad news. Jane just died. Like what? I just knew like you're putting this all together in your head. Now you go in and see someone like me, a trained psychotherapist, and you share this story with them. The psychotherapist is going to sit back in their seat and say, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, uh-huh, thank you. Sounds like a really stressful experience, wasn't it? You know, so, so, and I say this with humility, but honesty about my mental health profession is not up to speed on this. So that's the first type of, of uh, we call it a mode of participation, the way in which you can participate in a shared death experience. That's a sensing one. Now, all of these can be inclusive because there's four modes. So the next mode is witnessing or observing. And this is, we call this witnessing or observing death-related phenomena. But really the phenomena is near death experience phenomena. And this is really, you know, this is for you, this is of course your expertise. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. So the phenomena we're looking and coding for when we're interviewing are experiences like this. You see deceased loved ones. You see elevated 
uh, beings of light, any kind of elevated being. Angelic is a, a term we often hear. You see heavenly realms. You have a, a shift or change in the time-space continuum. Uh, there's a boundary of which you, you as the experiencer, as you're witnessing the dying progressing on this journey, you find a boundary, a place in which you realize you cannot go any further, but your departing loved one will. You have a life review. And the life of, there's various types of life reviews that you can have. We'll talk about those a little bit more if you're interested in the specifics of the life reviews, because they're a little bit different than the NDEs. Uh, and then I want to say the most common feature of when you're witnessing phenomena, and it's the most common feature in the shared death experiences, the experiencer sees the dying. They see, observe, witness the dying progressing along this journey to the light. The light is the other feature that is like the NDE. It seems to be the destination, if you will. Mm -hmm. Unlike the SD, unlike the NDE, the SDE experiencer typically does not go into the light. It's usually, you know, out in the out in the distance. And the light can manifest in different ways as a cylinder or a beam uh, that uh, a bridge of sorts that you're traveling up. So the, that's the second type and the, uh, the second mode of participation. The third mode of participation in, in a shared death experience is accompanying. This is when the experiencer says, I was accompanying the dying along this journey. So you're still seeing all this, you know, uh, NDE or death related phenomena that I've just talked about, but you're actually progressing on this journey with them. So unlike in the witnessing and observing state, you're just kind of stationary and observing snapshots of this, if you will. In the third mode of participation, you're actually moving with the dying in their progression. The fourth uh, mode of participation, which is the last one, is what we call assisting. So the assisting happens when, well, I'll give an example. The experiencer says, wow, I found myself with my father who had just died, and he was confused. And so I looked at my father and said, hey, 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 you know, dad, you've died. And he goes, I, 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 I have, or, you know, and a little com conversation goes on here. And then the, uh, in the assisting situation, he or she orients the dying typically to the light and to the elevated beings who are there to help. And so they, they serve as a guide to the dying. And you may be saying, wow, how, how does that happen to? Well, it happens to people who arrive in that space and actually have no known knowledge upon their arrival about how to do that guidance the knowledge for how to guide and assist their loved one arrives in that moment. And it's kind of miraculous as they describe it. So that's um, a, a definition of the SDE. And I want to say a few more things. The dominant motif in the SDE, to be clear, is that of journey. We, you can have lots of kind of paranormal or spiritually transformative experiences around the end of life. But for us, the key pattern that I identified is this is a journey taking place that we're privy to be a part of. The second piece is relationship. Relationship is the substrate of the shared death experience. And I, I hope, Scott, if you're willing, we can talk about your experience, uh, your personal SDE, because it is just a beautiful example of the bond and strength of relationship to enable uh, an SDE. And the, and the um, I think that the third one is just to realize and so many of your listeners are gonna be familiar with the NDE. Basically, those of us who research this, and I'm thinking now of Raymond Moody and, and others, we talk quite openly about the understanding that the SDE and the NDE are in the same landscape. This, yep psychic landscape. So the experiences are largely similar in terms of uh, possible phenomena that you can have. Yep. I was struck by um, 
the story that was in the in the book where there was a uh, young man with his father and his, his father was in this dark space and he um, didn't know what to do. And it was the son who said, you know, we got to turn around, dad, there's a there's light behind you. And you know, dad hadn't thought about turning around to see what was in that space. And it was the it was the son who wound up orienting him towards the the light and then you know and they progressed onward so that's um yeah it, so yes many touching stories so let's back up for a second and um i'm really curious about how you got into this whole realm of of conversation and experience thanks yeah you know i have been very reticent uh, until, well, until about 10 years ago. But if I look at the most of my life, I had a near death experience at 17 years old. And it was a high speed skiing accident. And when I crashed, I broke my back, I fractured my low spine. And I was catapulted out of my body instantly. What I remember is I saw my body on the slopes. And I was moving briskly away from my body and enamored at peace feeling just like an observing eye if you will for the beauty of of planet earth i could see first lake tahoe because i was skiing in squaw valley and then i saw san francisco bay and you know continent you know the colorado rockies were beautiful and and the continental US. And then I had like a satellite view of planet Earth. And as I'm enjoying this, I'm also seeing a life review in my mind. And everything I'd ever done recorded, shown to me, really about how everything, every action, every thought we, um, you know, exhibit, if you will, has an impact. It was a teaching on karma and the ripple effect of how we actually, our actions, our thoughts, our speech matter. And at 17 years old, I was a typical 17 year old, the, the, uh, the movie that was being played back to me was saying, you know, you could do a lot better with some of your interactions. Um, so, and then I entered into this tunnel. Of, and like I say, as, you're, as you and your viewers would know, this is a pretty classic NDE. And through that translucent rib tunnel, I could see a beautiful universe glistening and glowing and alive. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I was at peace and, and enamored. Then the light appears at the end of this tunnel and I realize I'm dying. And I did not want to die. And I start pleading, first talking to myself with frustration. Oh, I don't want to die. I, haven't, I didn't finish what I came to this earth, this human incarnation to do. And I'm just cruising and, you know, heading towards this light. And I'm remembering now, you know, hundreds of lives after hundreds of lives, maybe more being in this exact same space. And I'm heading into this light and I finally get to the light and I'm just yelled at this light with a sense of exasperation, quite frankly, like, I don't want to die. I didn't complete what I came here to do. Now I'm very much enjoying feeling this light because it's so velvety, so beautiful, so warm and i'm you know I'm, i have a level of peace and awe but i've been here before and i'm like i'm not done and god as i referred to this light kind of pushed back on me and as i was going back the other direction said make something of your life and so i spun back into my body now i share this experience in some detail because it is an experience that was extremely profound for me. I did not speak about it for about 10 years. I didn't even know what I'd had, but it changed my life. Not just because of the physical injuries where I was unable, I lost my identity, quite frankly, as an athlete. I was in chronic pain, increasingly so. But it may, but I was, I was responding to that pain in this new understanding of myself or lost understanding of myself, I was in a lot of stress and 
psycho-emotional existential angst that I didn't even have terms for until much later. But I did make decisions out of that place, uh, like I went to live and work in Central and South America after college, which is not something that I would have done with my upbringing as a, you know, upper middle class, well-educated young man. Uh, most of my contemporaries were going into, you know, more financially rewarding traditional uh, career paths. So I had that. And, um, and so that's, that's was a seminal experience. And why don't we pause there? I have some more things uh, to say about my path, but I, I see you have a question. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, so you were negotiating with God on your way to the light. Um, how did that go? Yeah, you know, I was kind of uh, impetuous. You know, I was upset and I was angry and I was, quite frankly, I was entitled uh, in a way. Mm. I was just really bent out of shape. I didn't even know the damage I had done to my physical body. I had no idea. Um, you just knew you were in a space that meant that you were dying because you had hundreds of times to been in yeah. this place before. Yeah. Yeah. And as you're well aware, uh, Scott, from your you know research and understanding of the NDE, that is not a common response. No, and I talk, no, I talked to I once brought this up to Bruce Grayson and uh, and I asked him and I said, do you know people that get to that space and really plead to go back? He goes, oh, not, not doesn't really come up in the research. Most people are, you know, don't want to have to be told they have to go back. You know, they want to stay there. You know, I'm thinking of one of our colleagues, uh, Mary White, who had her NDE and she had kids and a whole life at home. And she was still willing to stay, uh, wanting to stay up in that realm. Uh, and they said, no, you got to go back. So. And she's not alone, but she's just so well known with her story. So, um, but for me, I really wanted to go back and I was negotiating with God. Um, not to say that I had any influence. I kind of now look like this was, this was kind of my plan, if you will. I was going to do not, I mean, this is a deeper question for which I can have questions, but not a whole lot of insight. I should say I have conjecture about it, but that's about it. Um, but yeah, I definitely fought to come back to this life. And here's the other thing. When I finally got back into my body on the ski slope, I came back into it. I, I felt the cold snow and I had no feeling in my body. None. I, all I could feel was some sense of coolness on my back, but I realized I had no sensation in my hands and feet. And I said, God, don't let me be paralyzed. And as I said that the feeling came across my body. And I started like a, being under a warm shower. You feel the energetic ripples move into your extremities. I said, thank you, God. What's interesting, and I was really in conversation with God, no doubt about it in my mind. I was negotiating and pleading. What I regret is I didn't, I should have asked, I didn't know that I should have asked for, please don't live, allow me to live, uh, let me live in, in chronic pain and disability, which unfortunately, or however you want to look at it, was the way I've lived for 42 years now. Um, I'm much better than I was. There was a time when walking was very difficult, when I couldn't sit at all, when um, I was basically handicapped, you know. Yeah, I actually have run into a number of people who've done the negotiation thing to come back, mostly their young mothers who are extremely, you know, they want to raise their, their kids. They don't want somebody else to do it. And um, universally, they all said just exactly what you did, which is I should have negotiated for my body being whole. Yes. <laughs> and not to have the damage of the injury still there or the cancer or whatever. So maybe by, um, broadcasting these interviews, we can smarten up in our negotiations with the divine. That would be a wonderful gift to humanity for all the near-death experiencers, of which we know there are millions. If they know, listen, when you're coming back, this is your checklist and, and healthy body and mind being really one of them. 
I love it. So you were going to continue on with um, your story. Yeah. So I ended up working in Central and South America and and two in, in Guatemala, where I was doing my language studies, uh, there was a civil war going on. This is the mid 80s. And then also I was placed uh, in Peru. I was with the Jesuit International Volunteers. And so I was a social worker and teacher um, for these, you know, Jesuit outposts. There's the mission territory of, that's what they call it, the missions. Uh, although the work, to be really clear, was really about social justice and helping refugees. There wasn't a whole lot of religious proselytization at all. At least I wasn't engaged in that. But civil war in, in Peru at that time was brutal. There were a lot of refugees in the town we were in. There was a lot of starvation, a lot of famine, a lot of conflict between the military and the indigenous people. And it was intense. And I was in pain myself. And I was working with a lot of people who were um, on the margins of society, uh, mar on the margins of living, quite frankly. I mean, we're talking about these are people living in straw houses and, and ghettos. And, and But in a certain way, it was very healing for me to be with people who were struggling with so much pain and suffering. It normalized my experience in a sense that my sense of American uh, entitlement, if you are first world entitlement that, you know, this shouldn't happen to me. I should have a healthy body. Look at all my friends do. And, but being with these people really was a, a healthy leveler to my way of seeing a human life and realizing, you know, wow, we all have our challenges and, you know, I can go back, which I did to my, you know, well-to-do, um, you know, Northern California life livelihood. Um, but that wasn't, but that wasn't, that was just, that was just a human possibility. In other words, the vast majority of the people I was living and working with were suffering a great deal um, from things that I, my mind, my North American mind could not relate to. But like I said, it was very healthy, humbling, and quite frankly, um, healing to me to realize, okay, I've got some major pain issues here. And yeah, the world I live in is not sensitive to it. And, um, and that's unfortunate, but I know too much about life now to be entitled uh, in a certain way. So those experiences were profound in a psycho-emotional and spiritual way. But my first job when I got back, or one of my first jobs was to work as a social worker in San Francisco. And the AIDS epidemic broke out in, mm. and the HIV virus was at that time not understood. There was no cure. And, and I was working in the Skid Row of San Francisco. And what ended up happening was so many uh, previously, you know, functional, fully engaged, well-to-do gay men were impoverished. They lost their jobs. They lost their health. And they ended up, you know, live, moving to Skid Row just to survive. Uh, it was the cheapest housing they could find, and there was a scourge going on. I mean, this was a, this was a, you know, a, a pandemic of sorts for this community. So I ended up having a lot of contact with this community and helping them both with uh, food and uh, supplies but also, you know, mental health. I was a social worker, so I'd help them make sense of their situation. And I developed a, a lot of beautiful relationships with the men in this community and, and learned a lot about human spirit and courage and uh, faith and in community. Boy, the way this community helped one another was uh, just so inspiring. One experience I'll share was related to the shared death experience was I was working with a, a, a man by the name of um, Brad. And Brad lived in a homeless encampment in a burned out building. And he had a community of men he was with. And they were gathered there uh, in poverty. And he, he was kind of this, you know, I want to say he was a, a a death midwife of sorts. He was one of those persons who really knew how to help 
people die. And he learned that because he had lost so many friends. And so I would be helping him with supplies that he would need to, you know, food and other things that help his community. But he'd also share a lot what was going on with him. So I'd provide him a lot of, you know, just a, a listening ear, if you will, you know, mental health support. And one morning he came in quite early and, I, and he would look just wiped out, disheveled and I beleaguered. And I said, Brad, what happened? He goes, oh, Randy died last night. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. Cause I know he's been struggling for so long. And he said, yeah, but it was beautiful. I said, it was beautiful. He goes, yeah. I said, well, tell me. So Brad, proceeds to tell me that Randy's dying with this, you know, this encampment of these, they called, he called these people, his brothers, the brothers were surrounding Brad, helping him, comforting him, uh, you know, just holding vigil, waiting for um, Randy's death. And uh, Randy eventually dies. And Brad describes Randy traveling up a cylinder of light. Mm. And at the top of this cylinder of light, or at least midway, kind of above his body, he stops and he looks around at everybody who's cared for him and says, thank you. And Brad says, you know, William, he was so healthy. The AIDS virus and the carnage to his body was gone. He was young, he was vibrant, he was happy. And he was telling us, thank you, I'm well. And then he continued up that light and left. And Brad also described something we hear in the SDE is that the, the building, the walls and the ceiling of the building were gone. It was like he was traveling up into the, to the, you know, heavens, if you will. So that was, that was the first SDE that I'd actually heard shared with me. And, and he looked at me as if to check me out and say, do you believe me? And I, I, yeah, I knew Brad pretty well, but I can tell you one of the reasons I had no doubt about it was because it resonated with my own NDE at 17 years old on that ski slope. Sure. So this was just like affirmation. So I would have, um, I would hear more about those experiences in um, the Tenderloin of San Francisco as a social worker. Not too many, though, just a couple more, not nearly as uh, fully developed in, as that SDE. But I would have another NDE a couple years later, uh, just a blood imbalance, a severe one, idiopathic thromocytopenia for the medical people, basically low platelets. I was at risk for drowning in my blood. I was in the ICU. All I remember is passing out in the emergency room. And the next thing I remember is waking up uh, above my body in the ICU, although I didn't know who I was. I was just an observing something or other, like just a oh, consciousness cruising around the... That's interesting. You lost your sense of identity. Well, I, I, I wasn't connected to it. I was just like, oh. I guess, I, I just, I knew... I knew where I was, I, like I wasn't worried. I knew I was, I think I knew I was in the hospital, but I didn't really have a strong sense of connection to me and what had happened to me. Like okay. I, it wasn't until the doctor tapped on my hand and called out my name and said, oh, that's interesting. He's calling out my name. But I didn't really get until I moved over, my consciousness moved over to see the face on that person in that bed. And I realized, oh my gosh, that's me. And then I had this question, well, should I answer him or not? Well, and what if I do answer him? Because he's called out my name, Mr. Peters, Mr. Peters. And I decided to answer him. And as I did, I felt myself fill into my body. I felt the energy similar to the experience I had in the ski slope where the energy came back into my body and I started feeling physical sensation. And the most profound sensation um, was opening my eyes and now seeing this doctor's face 
where before I was looking it down on him from above and hearing him talk from above. So then I answered him and that, and that was it. Now, um, so that was, that was a, another uh, near-death experience. But as we know, that one was really just an out-of-body experience. No other, you know, more far-fetched experiences that I had in the previous one. So in my estimation, I was in that terrain of the afterlife, what comes next, but in that first stage, I was I hadn't gone into another dimension yet per se. Yep. So so with this, you know, then I went into Zen hospice work about, I don't know, a few years later. I was fascinated at this point. But I should say I was so resistant to ever talking about my NDEs. And I still wasn't talking about them, even when I was at Zen Hospice. Uh, and I should say Zen Hospice Project was a very progressive hospice. Uh, and it was there at Zen Hospice that I had my first. Um, you know, I, I had, I had another and uh, SDE kind of earlier, but this was one where I really got it. I was reading to Ron. Yeah. So I'm with Ron and I'm reading him a story in, uh, as I had done every afternoon while I was working with him. And on this afternoon, uh, he was typically as he was, uh, unresponsive. He had been unresponsive for a number of days, I think up to a week or two. And I popped out of my body. And there I was just right above Ron's body, right above my body. I could see myself reading below and I see Ron prone in his bed. But then I look to my right and there's Ron right with me. And oh, he's smiling. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah, he's at peace. And he's almost inviting me into this realm. Uh, as if to say, check this out, William, this is where I've been. And I was comfortable here, a little bit shocked. But once again, it was very similar to the experience I had in the ICU uh, with, the idio with the blood imbalance. So I went, you know, this is another very important piece in relationship to the SDE, the shared death experience. I was excited when I went back in my body and I went to see my supervisor and said, I just had this experience I want to share with you. And I said, you know, here I am reading the story to Ron and all of a sudden I popped up and I'm like looking down at Ron and my body from above. And he looked at me and he said, William, a lot of experiences can happen here. It's just phenomena, uh, phenomena rolling by, let it go. And by the way, the person in bed six needs you. And I said, okay. What? He really said that, let it go. Yeah, he did. And this is, but this, keep in mind, this is very, this is very a Buddhist. You know, you let your phenomena oh, go. I mean, Buddhists sure. are really great at having all sorts of, you know, yeah. spiritual experiences. But the general treatment, at least in my tradition, was to let it go, you know, hold on to nothing. And, yeah, so you know, it's ma maybe I, non, it's that whole non attachment thing. Yeah. It's the whole non attachment thing. Okay. And, and so I, and basically the way I took it was, oh, okay, well, this isn't really something that this is just an experience, no big deal. Um, maybe it happened. I mean, I, I, I didn't know what I was just so kind of taken back by that, that I just clammed up and I would have other experiences similar to that, not so much popping out of my body, but certainly seeing the light and the change in the geometry of the room as Raymond Moody used to refer to it. Um, and definitely feeling spirits or presences in the room, which is another very common experience in the SDE. But I never talked about it. So, and it wasn't until another decade later that I met Raymond Moody and he talked about the shared death experience. I mean, I thought I was going to hear Raymond talk about the NDE because that's why I was going to see him because I'd had two. But he starts out talking about the SD and says, hey, I want to tell you, there's an experience that's not very well known at all. And it's, you know, I've, it's called the, I've called it the shared death experience. And it's very similar to the NDE. And I just, I'm writing a book about it. And so when I heard that, I talked to Raymond and, you know, I could, long story short, he was very supportive of my interest to study this experience, to, to learn more about it. And to help people understand it. So with that, that's how I got into it. It's a long-winded way, but that's really, I mean, I, I really did not, you know, see myself going into any of this 
but it just became um, as a psychotherapist, as I'm working with grief and bereavement, I realized these are experiences happen and there's no understanding of them. Yep. I was thinking the, the same thing applies in um, near death experiences. There's a thing called fear of disclosure. You know, whoever you share your experience with first, if it goes well, you're prone then to talk about it. If it goes badly or people dismiss it, kind of like what happened to you, um, you know, you just kind of clam up for a while in, until you get some, some further reinforcement. So it was Raymond Moody who was your reinforcement. That's nothing like using the big names. Well, I, I'm so grateful because that was in 2009. And, you know, I had that big energetic experience when I heard him talk about the SDE and I realized this is my calling. This is what I've come here to do. I mean, here I am still in pain, difficulty walking, and I'm really looking for a way, I think those words from, you know, God, if you will, about make something of your life, I'm still trying to find a way to make sense of that. Like, how do I live into that? And I wasn't looking to do anything, you know, I was just waiting for a, sen a felt sense of, okay, this is it. And I'm not talking like I want to change the world or anything, or, but this felt like, oh my God, this is where my gifts and understanding meet or intersect with the world's need in my estimation. And so I've been on a mission ever since. So you made some references to a couple different kinds of um, uh, SDE experiences, geometry, and, you know, can, can you just take a couple representative samples that you happen to like to give us more of a sense of what an SDE could look like and feel like? Yeah, maybe I should just take um, some examples from the book because um, I go into a lot more detail there. So, well, you know, you, you had this great experience. You shared earlier about Mark T. Um, and Mark, I'll give the example of Mark because I think it's such an, um, an illustrative one. Mark is finishing a week-long outdoor education type program. And he's driving back in New Jersey with a buddy of his and Mark is in the passenger seat and he's resting. And all of a sudden he describes finding himself with his father in another dimension. And that dimension, the way Mark kind of describes it is, you know, there's kind of, it's just kind of open and spacious and not much around it in other words he's not even focused on it. he's just with his father and that's all he's focused on but his father is disoriented he's confused and mark looks at him and says you know dad you've died he goes oh you know and his dad doesn't really comprehend that he goes yeah you've died and i can help you and then as you noted in your little description of this he basically turns him a bit orients him to the light and then he he actually describes picking up his dad he actually describes walking with his dad but almost carrying him in a certain way and he describes him i think the language is he's just very very light uh and so he picks him he's walking with him and then eventually what he sees in coming out of this light is his mother uh his father's mother mark's you know paternal grandmother and he is very much at peace uh, when he sees his mother, he's, he, he embraces his mother. He's, you know, huge heartfelt. He was very close to his mother. So it was a very healing moment. And then Mark describes seeing his uncle as well, his father's brother. And there's a big, you know, nuclear family embrace there. And Mark's not included in this. There's kind of, uh, Mark doesn't even talk about the acknowledgement other than his father at some point turning around and saying to him, I didn't know it was this easy. And then there's the boundary for Mark. He's done. done. Um, but there's some other features in this that are important. And once again, the, the, the deceased relatives, in this case, mother and uncle, come out of the light. They're there to greet him. So there's welcoming party. This is a feature we have, a welcoming party. Yep. There's also the light, which you're heading towards. 
obviously the deceased relatives. The realm, as Mark describes it, is you know beautiful. Also, there's an ascension going on here. Uh, Mark describes you know kind of walking upwards or ascending a bit. We all we see this ascension feature quite a bit uh, in the SDE. Yeah. And just feelings of love, sublime feelings that Mark was able to experience there and kind of a sense of knowing what life and death are all about. Yeah, that is a great story. Um, uh, pick one up about, uh, what did Moody call it? Geometrical deformation oh. or something? Ch chain, Raymond had, he called these elements the elements of the shared death experience now we use different terminology slightly different terminology than raymond but you know keep in mind raymond wrote glimpses of eternity in 2010 beautiful book but he really did it out of letters that were written to him um, by some of his fans essentially people had read and and to eat we really went in and uh, did the the hardcore coding the research you know the the qualitative and then quantitative research on so we have the features down the percentages and all the rest of it but when you're talking and, about change bless you your, for that by the way <laughs> thanks yeah um change change in the geometry room is what we call change or change in the time space continuum so what what this one is about is imagine being at a, a bedside and all of a sudden the hard edges, the right angled corners of your room or the, or the room of the dying get rounded and soft. And all of a sudden you're, you're feeling a little, the vision's a little blurry. And then if you look up, um, there's a beautiful example in the book uh, with Carla. And Carla's talking about her husband who's dying in the hospital and she describes that this the the walls on the hospital go away and she sees her husband moving out of the hospital and she see at that wall and it's just there's no there's no it's just eternity it's just, mm -hmm. just it's just going on and on and there's brilliant colors and light swirling and, and she looks up and there's no ceiling. They're in a different dimension. Now, it starts in the hospital room. So the change in the geometry room is the whole physics of that room is now gone and you're in this celestial realm. Uh, so it begins with change in geometry room in the room, and, but then it becomes being in a heavenly realm, a different dimension altogether. So that's how that one tends to represent itself. That's really nice. Um, so people, when they have an SDE and they come back, um, they are profoundly changed in, in what kinds of ways? Yeah, so what we've seen in our research is, you know, a, a few profound shifts. The most pronounced after effect would be the experiencer stating that they know their deceased loved one is alive and well in a benevolent afterlife. They don't say, I think, or I believe. They use, I know. I know. They also say, I know that I'll see my loved one again. And I should say 87% uh, experience this, express that first one, knowing that they're deceased loved one is now alive and well in a benevolent afterlife. The second feature is this knowing that they'll see them again. Death anxiety and, um, and fear of death diminishes in the vast majority of our respondents as well. And grief, people's grief processes are greatly uh, improved in the sense that you know, you always will miss a loved one. And it's heartbreaking because that loss is painful. But they have a context to hold it in, which is very supportive and healing. They realize that 
this human life fits inside a larger uh, ultimate reality, that this is a, uh, a chapter in their larger uh, consciousness, if you will, trajectory. And, and that gives them a sense of peace, of understanding that they realize they've lost a loved one, but this is temporary. And the other thing we see is that people come back from this experience with a great deal of inner knowledge and a, an understanding for this purpose of a human life. And they get about making significant life changes to uh, live more in integrity from that experience. I think you said, um, I haven't fulfilled my purpose yet when you were 17 years old. Um, did you know what that purpose was or you just were trying to get at it? Well, at 17 years old, I certainly had no idea what my purpose was. And in fact, I think the first time I had an inkling for my purpose, a real sound inkling for it, was when I heard Raymond Moody talk. Mm -hmm. I mean, when he talked about the SDE, uh, I realized for the first time, oh my gosh, this could be my life purpose. This is so meaningful to me. And I really understood these experiences. Yeah, so I've got a list of the after effects from the NDE right here. And, uh, you know, boy, the, it'd be hard to tell the difference between the two. I think that's true. And I think that's because you, in the NDE and the SDE, you, you visit the same dimension, if you will. And the experience is similar. You know, whenever I've talked about NDEs to people and afterwards, somebody will come up to me and, and go, I wish I'd had a near death experience. And then I grab them by the throat and go, no, <laughs> no, you don't want to have that because it means that you have put your physical body through such trauma that it will take years to fix if it ever does. And there's, you know, all kinds of reasons why you wouldn't want to do it the near death experience route, but this shared death experience thing is really quite remarkable. Is there a way that we can um, increase the chance of, of having a shared death experience with someone we love? A yeah, great question. I mean, this is really what I've been studying for, you know, now well, over a decade. And the first research I did on this was on my methods that I, that I, I say that I created the methods. I think what I really did was I was, I was getting a download from, you know, how that is just kind of information from above, uh, from a divine source that was telling me kind of how to make these happen. And then I put them into a format that is now called the share crossing pathway. And we teach people methods to have these experiences it's really three steps though scott the first yeah. is raising awareness about a full continuum of end-of-life experiences we call this the shared crossing spectrum of end-of-life experiences and you know there's pre-death premonitions pre-death visions and visitations uh, an experience called terminal lucidity the shared death experience post-death visions visitations and synchronicities throughout and so this is the landscape of end of life that I think we should all know since we're all going to die and we're all likely going to be caregivers for someone. These are the spiritual experiences that are most meaningful and they serve as a helpful guide map to people. So, um, so that's the first thing I teach in this, in this program. And when I work with families and individuals who want to learn this, I start with that. And the SDE being the least known, at least up to the point of the research that my team has done, and now this public book uh, at Heaven's Door. But all this is requisite, because I really do believe you have to, it helps to know what's possible. So when you encounter it, you are receptive, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you can trust and go with it. The next piece in this training, and I suggest this for everybody is, you know, do a review of your life, Look at your regrets. Have compassion for yourself. 
work out anything you can do, forgive yourself, forgive others, do all that healthy mending, if you will. And then, you know, and then after that comes a sense of peace and gratitude for your life. And then now you're ready to uh, come to really accept the fact that you're going to die at some point and everyone you love is too. And so I encourage people in this workshop to step into that reality, to really go through in these guided visualizations, you know, what, what are you wanting to say to your loved ones? And how do you want to say goodbye? And what do you want for your end of life? Go through, have these difficult conversations about who do I want to be around my bed? You know, who do I want to be with me? Um, all these things are important conversations. And then at that point, you're kind of knowing that death is coming. And this is when I train in the protocols about how to have these. And then really the important thing to know about the protocol is because we tend, I, I ideally work with someone who's assumed to be dying and a caregiver, loved one. And we really teach receptivity. There's a whole, that's a whole training on how do you teach receptivity to the surviving loved one? Yeah. And then how do you teach the dying to essentially um, call back and invite the uh, loved one to be with them. And we don't know how this all works, but the methods go at it for both ways. And we tend to have a fair amount of success with this, with this type of training. I will say that uh, the, those who have the most success, and we've seen this in our research, are people that have med mindfulness practices, prayer, meditation, yoga. They have a, an ability to attune uh, to their experience. I, I think you called that something like uh, turning down the 22 brass band, you know, just, <laughs> I, I don't remember the exact quote, but it, it pops in my head that these mindfulness practices have a way of being able to calm our mindset and be open to experience that, yeah. could, that could come in. So yeah, you're, you're right. What the mindfulness practices do is focus, clear out the distraction. The monkey mind is going to be what it, what it does. You can watch the monkey mind, but you need to be able to attune to what you're feeling and to what's going on for the dying, because that's where the bridge is. There you go. And, you know, like in my experience, I know that um, Nolan and his mother, you know, reach back to me and pulled me through and pulled me into that experience. So there, um, there had to be a heart connection there. I think that's a, a, at least in my mind, a critical component. Yeah. And I'm so glad you're bringing up your experience, um, with Nolan and Mary Fran, um, because yours does exemplify a few really important elements. And that is, that as you said, they were inviting you there. They, in a sense, as you said, pulled you up. I like the pulled up because this is this, this ascension feature is a part of the SDE and we look for that. Yep. Uh, and then the embrace that you have with them and the, just the euphoric feelings uh, of belonging, but also knowing what was happening there I haven't heard you say this specifically, but I'm I'm also I'm gonna throw this out there as as painful as it was, there was a sense that this was what was meant to be. This was this was right. This was what you know it was painful. It was horrible, but there's a sense that this is what is. And although you can't comp comprehend it with your human mind, there's something greater going on here you said it well i mean there's parts of the of these the elements of the shared death experience that are they're ineffable they are really hard to describe really hard and that's why it's important for your book to speak because it gives us language so that we can talk to one another and know that this is this is the real thing it's it's a it's something that happens that is profoundly important. Yeah. 
And as a psychotherapist who works with people in grief and bereavement, I've heard many, many situations where, you know, one of the family members says, well, you know, I, I was just there, been with my mom all this time, and she, then she dies. And my sister has this amazing experience, which you're calling a shared death experience, but I didn't have that. Why is that? And there definitely seems to be uh, some pattern that suggests some people have the experience and some people don't. And I don't think it has a lot to do with receptivity at times. I mean, I think, I think there is, you can definitely block the experience for sure. But I think there are some people that I see that are open, but for some reason are either distracted at that time or just don't have it. Um, it's, it's common. And I will say this, for those families that have had the experience where one or, or two of the family members have it, and by the way, we call this a shared uh, multi-person, I should say a multi-person shared death experience. We see them quite a bit. I think there's about 15 to 20%. And in these cases, when I work with the family members, or at least the member who didn't have it, uh, they come around and say, you know, if my mom only had one person she could reach out to for some reason, it makes sense that she reached out to my sister. And I'm thinking of a case here where this individual who I worked with, his mother and him to facilitate the shared death experience, it was Francis and his mother, Diana. She was dying of pancreatic cancer. And he'd been with her for you know a couple of years and they did a whole prep course with me and all the rest of it. Well, the moment of death, Francis is not at bedside, but his sister Elizabeth is. Elizabeth describes the moment of death, seeing this figure come down, a uh, big ominous figure, and looking at her and saying, I've got it, step aside. And then he <laughs> takes really? his, yeah. <laughs> takes his hands and does this. This, is, this, by the way, is a motion that we've seen in a, in a number of cases that is kind of beckoning. Sometimes it's described as angel wings kind of pulling and coaxing the soul spirit out of the body. And in this case, Elizabeth describes seeing her mother rise out of the body and go with this ominous figure uh, into a beautiful, once again, geometry of the room changes, sealing off, just going into the heavens. But yep. when, in this case, the reason I'm bringing this up is Francis acknowledged, hey, I'd been with my mom a lot at the moment of death. I mean, I've been, been, been with my mother during her death and dying process, excuse me. And Elizabeth had just gotten down, spent a week, and she'd really not got the time with her mother that that would have been ideal. And so she got this final parting gift. And I think there's a sense of there's some divine wisdom or justice said differently, design wisdom and justice about allocating these experiences in a certain way. Now, this is conjecture, but I've seen a lot of these experiences where the person who seems to have this uh, either needs it, or it's some sort of function that's positive. Uh, and but that's not to say that some people don't have it. And others do. And the reason they don't have it is because they're not open to it. They're too much in their heads, they're distracted. You know, and so you can only do so much. Yep. We're getting close to our time here. So I have two questions I'd like to end with. Um, one is, uh, what's been the reaction to um, your book from the general public and from uh, the professional, you know, medical community, the, the people yeah. who really need to hear this, hospice workers? Yeah, thank you. Clergy or whatever. Yeah, keep in mind the book has only been out for two weeks, um, but thankfully it's doing quite well. Um, it's being you know, picked up and the reviews have been really thankfully, similar to what you began our time, our interview here today with, very positive, recognizing that it's, that this is, 
a phenomena that has been discounted, dismissed, in some cases disparaged. The general public response has been largely either in that camp of, wow, I had something similar, I've heard of something like this, and this is so affirming, thank you so much. I'm gonna give this to everyone I know to say, look at that experience I had with my mom when she died, you see it's right here. This is what you know. this book At Heaven's Door is talking about, and there's research to say it's real. So a real confirmation validation for so many people who have the SDE and um, they don't doubt themselves, but they find this to be a way to really uh, let others know that, that they had this and it was real. So that's a real positive thing. Other people are saying they just find these stories so encouraging and it's helping them reshape the way they look at end of life, death and dying, and they're excited by it and they're sharing it. And the third one is healthcare providers, mental health professionals. Um, I just gave a talk to California Association for Marriage and Family Therapists, our, one of the chapters here. And, you know, afterwards, a good couple dozen people emailed me and reached out to me to say, thank you so much. I've heard of these experiences. I never know as a psychotherapist whether I need to validate these are real or do a mental status exam, like see if they were having a, a, a grief-related hallucination or delusion or worse yet, some sort of you know, psychosis, which means kind of a loss of, of mental stability and clarity. So this book really, people were, you know, my colleagues were reaching out and saying, thank you, because now I can say to someone who brings in these experiences, which most had heard about, to say, you might want to read this book. This is a great reference because here it is, the stories which will you know, affirm yours, but also the research to let you know um, just how well studied this is now. Yeah. That's, I'm really happy for you that we're getting a, a positive uh, response to this. Okay, let's wrap this up with how do we keep in touch with you, find your book, know about your classes, give us a commercial here, uh, William. I, I appreciate that. Uh, the one, I'll tell you the one commercial that I'd really make, and I think this is more of just for all of us and the human species, let's talk more about these experiences. I encourage everyone who's listened to your interview today, you know, Scott, you've done a really beautiful job of eliciting, I mean, my knowledge about this and you've shared your story. Um, I invite your listeners to share it with their friends and take risks to say, hey, I listened to this, you know, William and Scott talk about this. And what do you think? Let's just get these conversations going. I'm thinking of our, you know, when pre-pandemic, when we used to gather at the International Association for Near-Death Studies, those conferences, which hopefully we'll have again this year, um, where we really have these conversations and we really rally the base and uh, affirm one another. This is what we need to do as a, as a culture around this is to talk about these experiences, normalize them, and talk about them with your healthcare providers in particular. So that's the first thing I just say for this is a general well-being, just as the, for the common good of our culture, let's wake up to these shared death experiences. Similar to what we did with the near-death experiences, we're just probably a few decades behind. Uh, so that's that. And then with the, you know, to find me and my, uh, my team, my organization, if you've had a story, please reach out to us at sharedcrossing.com and you'll go to the contact page and we want to hear your stories. Uh, also, we do, we have lots of courses. We're bringing them online. I have a course coming up just in the next few weeks with uh, Dr. Raymond Moody. And uh, we'll, he's, you know, as I mentioned earlier, he's really the first person to popularize the term shared death experience. And so Raymond and I are going to be doing a, a, a group and it's going to be something where you can just do a self-study modules. And then Raymond and I'll get on probably every month or so for a Q and A and I'll, we'll take your questions. So it's a really open-ended user-friendly model. And then I'm going to be offering a deep dig uh, course in the SDE later this spring and probably April. And there'll be all sorts of other programs we're doing in person, depending on COVID and also um, online. So I just really encourage you to reach out to us, get on our mailing list. We have great resources. And the last thing I want to say is we have a story library. 
And this story library is the first of its kind with shared death experiencers from our research sharing their experiences three to five minutes we've really boiled them down and you'll hear people from all walks of life from all over the world sharing their experience well all over the world is a stretch united states europe canada um yes we we were hoping to get further reach and we will um, but this is a way you can really hear about the shared death experience and then thank you, you know, Simon Schuster is my publisher. You can get At Heaven's Door pretty much anywhere. Um, I did the audio book if you like audio, so you'll hear my voice if you're not exhausted by it after this interview, so. <laughs> oh, thank you, William. So this uh, uh, story library, is it video, audio, printed? It's video. You'll it's see video. our interviews very much. You know, we do interviews uh, just the way you and I are doing them here today, Scott, on Zoom, and then we edit them down and we put them on this library and story library, and you can you can see it. And we have resources too about the shared death experience and shared crossings generally. This spectrum of end of life experiences, which we call shared crossings, it's all there on the website. It's for public service. It's all good, William. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a wonderful time together. Bless you for writing this book, and I wish you the best of luck. And you know, may you sell a zillion copies. Thank you, Scott. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and I'm so glad you're uh, doing this. You know, this new podcast, Afterlife Files. I think it's going to be a hit. We need it, and I'm sure your viewers uh, will become devoted rather quickly when you see you know all the people and all the information you're going to provide. So, thank you. I was right, wasn't I? I took four pages of notes. How about you? William made some points that I think could be enhanced. Just to be clear, these are my perspectives, but that's why you watch the Afterlife Files, to gain perspectives by using more than one lens with which to view these very rich stories. First off, William's life review. During a near-death experience, life reviews often have three perspectives. First is that of yourself. You get to live your life over again, just like you did the first time with every thought, emotion, sensation you had when you were alive in the physical universe. Second, you get to live your life over again, but this time from the perspective of the other person in the relationship or the exchange. You get to know what they were thinking, feel their emotions, and have all the sensations in the exchange. You become the other person. For real, you become the other person. Okay, third, you get to have the omniscient perspective. How did the relationship or the exchange matter to others after it was over? How did it spread from you to family to the community? William called this the ripple effect. He emphasized that you get to experience the karma in every reaction, each and every thought. I think the purpose is for us to realize the consequences of our energy, our actions, our thoughts. Our thoughts and actions matter. Thoughts are things. Let me repeat that. Thoughts are things. So the question is, what thoughts will you entertain today? and every day. Okay, next up. William also negotiated the light in his near-death experience. He negotiated with the light in his near-death experience. He wanted to change the course of action. He was dying and he knew it, and he didn't want to die. And later, he didn't want to become paralyzed. Since he'd been in this situation hundreds of times, some part of him knew that he could plead his case. He did and was successful. He was given a second chance to change the outcome of his life in the physical. All right, next up. This next tip is worth the price of admission. You can negotiate all kinds of things in your near-death experience. Take advantage of this opening to get what you want. More on this in a future episode. Okay, next insight. 
After you watched the interview, did you want to have a shared death experience? I'd do it again. It's amazing. In William's story, his path was smooth by helping Ron in his transition. Remember where he lifted out of his body and he was stood next to him? And of course, he had an out-of-body experience during his second near-death experience. These warm-ups can help you have a shared death experience. So, learn to do the practices that allow these experiences ahead of time. William suggested mindfulness, prayer, yoga. What I found really effective is learning styles of meditation that can help you learn to be energetically aware of your surroundings, the ability to attune to the experience as it's happening. The Expanded Awareness Institutes Into the Light Albums or our Near-Death Experience Intensive Retreat will teach all of these, out of body, working with guides, merging with light beings, exploring the light. If you've gone there ahead of time, it will be easier when the time is ready for a shared death experience to occur. William entreated us to become aware of the possibility so when you encounter it, you're receptive, you trust it, and go with it. Here's an insight, one I hope you caught. William described the light as having edges, as in most experiencers don't go into the light. He said that, remember? He also described the light as God, those of us who've had the experience of everything being made up of the light of God would have another take on what is the light. Some experiencers would describe the light as an aspect of God, for in their world, God is everything and has no edges. Stay tuned. We have a guest coming up where we will explore the implication of the light having edges. And lastly, in my shared death experience, Mary, Fran, and Nolan pulled me into it. We didn't have an agreement to do this ahead of time, but if you have the time and a willing partner, making that commitment to reach out to the one still in the physical world would be really helpful. That's it for today. If you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, and comment. If you, find, you can find the Afterlife Files on all the podcast streaming apps. Apple, Google, Spotify, Audible, all of them. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Bye for now. We'll see you next time.